<clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, I participated in many Europythons before, always as an attendee, and I always had a really great time. So this year, for the first time, I decided to also submit a talk, and I'm very excited to have the opportunity to be here today on stage with all of you. I work at uh, Kiwi.com, the global travel tech company. At Kiwi.com, we use Python to build innovative product uh, for travelers. And my team specifically works with uh, disruptions and travel emergencies domains. Working uh, with uh, travel emergencies can be sometimes quite a challenge. I remember a um, few events, especially during uh, COVID, COVID pandemic and also short after uh, an outbreak of war on Ukraine, when we had uh, literally just a few hours to deploy changes to our production. And we used to struggle a lot with this. Mm. Yeah, sorry for minor technical issue. Uh, we used to struggle a lot with our delivery times. And today in this talk, uh, I will share a few tricks and a few changes we did to our architecture to be more efficient. I bet you've seen similar picture before. The client server model uh, is with us for a long time. It's probably fine to say that uh, since the expansion of the internet, and uh, it cannot work without a good API. Historically, there have been many different approaches. We used to render HTMLs from the servers and different things. And what became over recent years de facto standard for client-server communication is the concept of REST API. In REST, server typically exposes a set of uh, resources our typical REST could look like one resource giving you all the data about bags, another one for refunds. And the client uses predefined operations to interact with these resources. A good example might be getting all the baggage related data for target booking or doing post request to let's say submit refund request. And the responsibility of the client is to use these low-level resources and transform them into UI components that are communicated to clients. <clears throat> the client server model with REST is uh, simple and flexible. And uh, in the traditional client-server model with a three-tier architecture, we have a clear split of responsibilities, where server is responsible for the data layer, encapsulating the data plus the application layer, while on the client, we have the user interface and user, user interaction. Over a decade ago, the age of mobile began and mobile devices uh, slowly started to dominate the landscape. When we take a look at our data, as an example, in the post-booking part of Kiwicom app experience, over 80% of users prefer to use the app on mobile device. So what does this mean to our client server model? We still have one server, but now it needs to serve three different clients, typically the iOS and Android native apps and the web client. What makes this challenging is that each client has different requirements. On the technical side, the good example might be that the mobile device prefer to make only one request per page that is rendered. And on the UI and product side, the most uh, visible thing, the screen size is smaller for mobile device. 
and also we have different types of uh, interactions like push notifications, live activities, and so on and so on. The second issue we have, and this most probably depends on the size and team layout of your company, but in our case, building smaller or average feature means that we now need to involve three engineering teams. And you can probably imagine that this introduces significant communication overhead. And finally, whatever code lies on the client side now needs to be implemented three times in three different languages. We need to test it all. And especially in the product-oriented environment, this is a significant issue. I'm not mentioning those travel emergencies. We always like to iterate quickly. We want to set up an A-B test in a few weeks, collect the data, see if it works, and then either promote it or move on to another hypothesis we want to test. So all of these processes, triple implementation, communication overhead, is slowing us down. <clears throat> and uh, this triple implementation can also lead to inconsistencies on the clients. Uh, let's check this example. On the Android mm, app, native app, we had this banner colored differently. We figured out short before the planned release. Oh, if there is some minor uh, edge case not covered, one of your clients can just start crashing. Yeah, and I remember also this one. On the iOS, uh, it started after some release just rendering a blank page completely silently. It wasn't even visible in our monitoring dashboards. Quite frustrating. Let's now take a look at the schematic overview of the general purpose REST API and three client setup. It's quite messy and complicated, isn't it? So what can we do to improve this? When we started our research, the pattern called backend for frontend took our attention. Who knows, uh, backend for frontend, can you raise your hands maybe? Quite a few, and who uses it on production? Something similar? <laughs> Just give you people, <laughs> okay. Um, with our engineering team, we don't like uh, lengthy waterfall projects. And what we like to do is more like reuse existing solutions, build quick prototype, deploy it, and see the result. Like sometimes we realize it works well. We realize that some specific aspect needs further improvements, or we can see that it turned out not to be a good idea at all in the end, and we need to find different solution. And also when adopting BFF, we took similar approach. And those REST APIs, they are okay. Then they can stay there. And their responsibility is simply to still encapsulate the data and expose those low level resources. <clears throat> uh, then we introduced this new backend for frontend layer and connected it to the REST, REST endpoints. And its responsibility is to take those low-level resources and transform them into higher-level views. And we technically migrated a significant portion of the presentation layer from the clients here into this shared space. And finally, for those new BFF-style endpoints, we reworked our clients a bit. They are now much thinner, and we connected them into this BFF layer. And their responsibility is now simply to display stuff, to take the prepared view and render the components. With this setup, we efficiently mitigated the triple implementation. It is still there, but much, much smaller uh, piece of, of logic. But over time, a small API parameter called client ID appeared in our requests to BFF, telling the handler that I am mobile client or I am the web client. And we realized that the problem of, of uh, specific requirements is still there and it's significant. In order to deal with this one, we, in our second iteration, split the shared BFF into two pieces. 
one BFF specifically tailored for the needs of native mobile apps and a separate one for the client. And now we have the flexibility that we can adjust the release cycle, API versioning and everything, and also build endpoints specifically targeting the needs of each client. While if it makes sense, we still can share some code or even the whole views between those two in a shared library. And as we, as we of course, implemented our BFF in Python, a uh, very nice side effect is that we now have more Python in our stack. And also this BFF uh, became some like nice shared space where both front-end and back-end engineers can collaborate. As is a presentation layer built in Python, it's mostly about some API calls and transformation of the data onboarding front-end engineers here wasn't an issue. <clears throat> Let's now try to summarize the main advantages of BFF adoption. First is definitely the customization. The now we have option to build really customized endpoints for specific needs of each, of each client, satisfying the requirements. It can also bring some performance optimizations. Uh, as now we typically make only one request from the client to BFF layer, we can easily prevent overfetching of the data. <clears throat> and also the complexity of client development is significantly reduced. I mentioned the higher level of views served from BFF a few times. And this means we need a new style of API for this, as there are, these are not the classic REST API resources. Here in this case, we opted for another pattern, which is called server-driven UI. Again, the same exercise. Uh, anybody in the room uh, knows it? Not that many people. OK, so let's take a look at server-driven UI. The main idea is that we now represent the concrete visual components through JSON data. As you can see in this example, there is a one-to-one -one mapping between the JSON fields in the response and the concrete visual components we render on the client. For each component or element of the UI, like in this example, the header, title, and description, we have a dedicated JSON field containing already translated localized text that is ready to be displayed Oh, if, let's say, we work with some daytime objects, we will convert them to the local daytimes to ensure that everything in the response is ready to be displayed. In case of uh, clickable elements, like this one, alongside the translated text, we also provide the redirection URL in the response. And as for this banner in the bottom, we even specify the type of the component. In this case, it's type warning. And on the client side, this is passed into the shared UI component uh, library, the library of shared uh, tested components that are reusable. And it defines the message and the color of the banner, in this case, the orange color. And let's now imagine that our product manager wants us to change it to have a stronger message uh, and communication. With a single line change in the BFF layer, we will change the type from warning to, let's say, critical. And the color of the banners across all the clients listening to this endpoint will change immediately and consistently right away after the backend release. So a single line change defines how the UI should look like. As for the main benefits of server-driven UI, this is what can ultimately make your production releases faster. As for those, specifically for those smaller or like mid-size features, you typically don't need to touch clients at all. That means no coding in Kotlin needed or Swift, no need to release and wait for the App Store approval, no need to push your users to update the app, just release and immediate, it's, everything is like immediately propagated to all the clients. 
As we control it from one place, from the back end, we can also ensure cross-platform consistency as long as they listen to the same endpoint or, or the, the endpoint response is correct. We need to be, of, of course, careful if we have two BFFs still about the web versus mobile consistency. And also, if we are building some really personalized content and pages, rendering this or preparing the view on the back end has the benefit that we have all the context and all the data at hand. <clears throat> Let's now take a brief look on our concrete implementation of BFF and server-driven UI in Python. This is a very simple view class which is responsible for rendering of single page of the UI. Check it out. As we, for the beginning, build this BFF layer on top of a single Python project, we considered it unnecessary to introduce additional network calls. What we did instead is that we wrapped existing Flask handlers into this MMB client library and we just do a method calls to the REST API handlers directly from, from Python code. Here in the render method on the top, you can see a sequence of these REST resource calls. In this case, we need uh, generic info about the booking and then some details about the current schedule change offer for the booking. So we do this sequence of, of resources, we fetch the REST, REST responses. And then we do all the transformation, localization, and we compose the server-driven UI-style response that is returned and served to the clients. As a single UI page is typically centered around one entity or a couple of entities. In our case, it's typically one booking. If you have some more complex view and there are really like too many render uh, in the render method too many REST calls. It can happen that on the background there will be just too many very similar or repetitive SQL queries as it's all around one ID, one booking and you call many, many REST handlers. If this becomes an issue, we have an option to pre-specify a couple of entities we want to preload and this will on the background be represented as uh, SQL Alchemy query using the join load technique to preload all those, all those entities and cache them for the whole time of the rendering of this view. By uh, adopting these two patterns, we became more efficient and we improved our production delivery time. Thanks to BFF, the client-server communication is now simplified, and we also have an option to build those really like customized endpoints when needed. The server-driven UI pattern helped us to be much more efficient and have a faster production delivery, alongside other benefits like the personalization and consistency across all the clients. What also proved efficient here and also a few times before is uh, to not do, do not do waterfalls, but instead slice the end goal into small manageable pieces and then in each phase deliver something, start let's say with one or two endpoints, build in the new style and then evaluate what works, what needs some changes and based on that make an informed decision on the next steps. So if some travel emergency occurs today, we can just ask our content writers to provide new communication, new text. We can, in the personalized way, pick the subset of bookings that are affected. And in the BFF, we'll simply update the text of the banners. We can easily change the styling to more, more strong, stronger styling, or even introduce new banners in no time and roll them out to production easily the same day. And this slowly concludes the talk, but definitely not the story of three clients. So we definitely need to continue exploring both the 
architecture and the technical side of our solution to make sure that with each step and iteration, we become more efficient. I would like to thank you to my amazing colleagues from Kiwi.com for the support when preparing this talk. And uh, if you are interested in more tech content or events, I would like to invite you to follow our tech community called Kiwi.com. If you have any kind of questions, I will be happy to answer them either right now or also feel free to stop by later for some private chat at our Kiwi.com booth later or reach out to me on my LinkedIn. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael, for this wonderful talk. So we're now entering, as you might expect, the Q&A session. So feel free to come to the microphone and ask for questions regarding this talk. Um, if not, you can also write it down on Discord or watch it. I have not seen any questions on Discord so far. And we got the first person on the microphone. So please, yeah. speak. Um, with the backend driven UI, do you just send the banners or you send the complete UI similar to Nice, UI, nice Guy? Um, so you, you just have an app that renders the JSONs or the mobile apps have still like a lot of built in actions and your um, di dialogues, or can you all define that in the backend? Mm -hmm. I would say there is no straightforward answer to this. Like each page is different. Some is really simple, like the title, description, and banners. Some is more complicated. So I would say it depends on the specific use case. But in general, we try to have as much as possible defined um, from the back end. Uh, sometimes it's more or less. Um, but there is still, of course, something on the client, the formatting, uh, the ordering of the elements sometimes. But uh, the idea is that if we want to introduce new reusable component, or change the text, change the formatting, that should be possible from the backend only. I think also with the server-driven UI, there are like many companies using it, and each concrete implementation is a little bit different. Somebody is going as far as defining even maybe the centering of the elements. In our case, it's mostly defining the title description banner with the data, sometimes the order of the elements with the data, but it really depends. And of course, if it's more complicated, completely new feature, the mobile development is needed. But at least for, I don't know, 80% of use cases when we are changing the communication or introducing new banner, we should be now very, like, capable of making it without touching the clients most of the time. Cool. So another question, other side, let's switch and paralyze. Yeah, first, thanks for the talk. Uh, I haven't heard about server-driven UI. Um, my question is kind of follow-up from the previous one. Uh, why don't you just do a web app? That would, you don't need an app store anymore. You don't need different uh, apps for Android and iOS. You can deliver even faster. So what distinguishes your server-driven UI from just having a web app? Mm -hmm. uh, I think like we cannot say that there is like one size fits all solution. And uh, there are several approaches, again, like somebody is using HTMX, somebody can be maybe like rendering uh, HTML directly from server. And as I said, like we are moving uh, step by step, exploring, we did some, uh, some experimentation with GraphQL, we figured out it's not a use case for us. Then we like did this step from heavy client to a thin client and server driven UI. And this specific solution, I don't know, like, I don't know if it's an option. Maybe some other team in Kiwi tried it out. Uh, so I, I cannot provide like clear answer that it is or it's, it is not a fit for our use case. But definitely we can see that we are kind of circling back towards the heavy server control device, maybe a little bit going back to the age when we were really sending HTML. And it has significant benefits to do it. Okay. So we got on the other side, aside another question. Yeah, with the uh, BFF layer, is it possible for the APIs, the REST APIs, to return JSON directly and then just cut out the BFF layer and ha have, have the logic in the, in the REST component? 
Mm -hmm. You mean more like building server-driven UI style directly on top of the database without the BFF layer, something like that? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah I think this approach would solve most of the problems. And as I, as I explained, the BFF is basically just um, on the code level, just another like package enforcing some isolations. We basically wanted to have it in order, to have the isolated layers not to allow, because there are also many contributors not to do some really nasty stuff like taking SQL model and directly building, I don't know, whatever uh, presentation layer on top of it. So it's mostly for the isolation there. And I think if maybe the architecture is not that complex or there are not that many services, building server-driven UI directly on top of the database models would uh, also work quite nice. Yeah, there is also maybe sometimes some overhead of the extra layer, extra boilerplate boiler code. So this could work in our case, mostly having it nicely defined, isolated, to sort of have maybe those layers, like this is the, the application layer, data layer, and the presentation layer. But I think it's not that important or significant if it's really there as an extra layer connected through network, or it's not there at all, or it could be maybe some identical models Mm, as like connecting the, the application layer models to the UI rendering. There are, I think, many, many solutions. But this, for, for simple app, maybe today, I would go for the SQL Alchemy models or fast API identity models and probably server-driven UI layer maybe directly on top of it. We got time for another switch to this side. <clears throat> Okay, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, so what are, according to you, the disadvantages of PFF? And mm -hmm. what are the most uh, challenges? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that overhead, that if one endpoint or the response is really like simple, just like few fields, with BFF, you need to go through all the layers. You need to build, build like edit as a field to the database. Then you need to create the rest endpoint as a proxy, and the BFF is another proxy. So sometimes it depends on the framework you use, but there can be some overhead that are too many layers, serialization, testing. So this, I would say, is the most significant disadvantage. Good. Now a last quick question. Two minutes left. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so uh, I was wondering if this uh, backend-driven UI approach doesn't complicate a lot of things on the backend. I mean. Normally, there are things like some kind of labels which you only have to worry about on the front end. And uh, with the backend driven UI, you probably have to also store them on the backend in, somewhere in the code. And does it complicate the, the structure of, of the code quite a lot? Not sure if I really understand the part with the buckets you said. Uh, yes, I mean um, that some labels which you normally would store on the front end mm -hmm. and just use them to display data from the uh, API, uh, with this approach you would have to store, store them on the backend, right? In the, in the uh, backend code base. Uh, mm -hmm. Doesn't it somehow complicate like mm -hmm. uh, managing this code base? Like, um, maybe I'm wrong, maybe mm -hmm. it's... Yeah. Like, of course, the logic needs to lie somewhere. So we sort of moved it from the client to the backend, and there is little more work, but I don't know, at least it's now in Python. There are more people who knows uh, how to build it. And uh, I, I think in general, at least it's not three times, it's once in the shared space. And this setup uh, seems to be more efficient, uh, faster delivery. And we didn't encounter some huge issues like this is easy on backend and on, on front end and in BFF layer it would be complicated. Great. Okay, thank you. So thank you also from my side. Again, applause and nobody goes away without cookies. Thank you. Thank you.